Hello again. Um, if you followed along with us the last time, we had a conversation as to the emergence of North American slavery. Um, at this point, I know that you know that uh, slavery was experienced differently depending on exactly where and exactly who you're talking about. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to um, continue this conversation as it relates to slavery and specifically note uh, the ways in which African Americans, African and African Americans, I probably should say, experienced the practice of slavery and in many ways how they resisted. So that being said, I, the first thing that I want to point out is a unique aspect of North American slavery is an emergence of an African American community. Um, this is especially the case with the Chesapeake region, Virginia, Maryland, but as the uh, 17th century gives way to the 18th century and eventually into the 19th century, you will see more and more people being born to slave parentage on North American continent. These are not Africans, they're African Americans. And that's where I want to begin our conversation. In the early days of colonization, slave owners made it very clear that they wanted a variety of slaves. You didn't just want somebody from one specific part of the African continent. You wanted to, to diversify your slave lot. And the reason is pretty simple. It had everything to do with preventing them from conspiring against you. If you think about it, this will make a lot of sense. Um, you don't want people that can speak and read the same language. Uh, you don't want people that have a common culture and heritage. If anything, you'd like a group of rivals, uh, people that don't like each other, because that's going to make it very unlikely that they're going to conspire against you. So when these people are imported and once they start to live in North America, um, what you begin seeing is the creolization of the slave population. Now, that's a term that you ought to be familiar with at this point. I introduced it very early on in the semester. Creolization was a blending of cultures. We talked about it when we were talking about the Aztec Empire and Tenochtitlan. Um, but you're going to see this in the African-American community as well. You will see the transcending of cultures, uh, both African blended with the Anglo uh, cultures once uh, uh, everything takes root here in America. But even within the context of African, you see various uh, uh, distinct African cultures that are coming over here. Some are rubbing off on others and others are rubbing off on them. Um, probably about the best example that I can give you to that end would be the uh, formation of what's going to come to be known as Gullah. Now, Gullah is a language that's essentially a hybrid language. It consists of um, American English and not one, but numerous forms of African languages. And it's a language that we think emerged in the aftermath of slavery taking root, especially in South Carolina. As a matter of fact, the few people that are around today that could tell you a thing or two about Gullah and how this, uh, how this comes about are people that live in the eastern part of South Carolina. In any case, Gullah is a very good example of the variation of slave origins and the creolization of slave cultures uh, once slavery takes root in America. The next thing I want to talk about is the rise of the Southern gentility. Simply put, the people that came over to America basically were coming out of economic necessity. It's probably a little bit more complicated than that, but the point that I'm trying to make is they, they had grown up largely with a chip on their shoulder. George Washington's a good case in point. Washington was told again and again that he would never fulfill his dream of becoming a officer in the British military. And they were pretty blunt in terms of why. Um, you're an American. You were born in America and you're not as good as us. And that will forever bar you from the officership of the British military. And so no, that was the curse of the colonials, if you will, second class status. In the Americas, very early on, the way that one distinguished oneself from other white people would be amassing collections of slaves. Um, this might not make a lot of sense to you, but one thing that was very, very fashionable in the, in the 17th and 18th century, uh, probably more like 18th and 19th century, but in any case, uh, was very pale white skin, 
And what that meant was you didn't have to get out there in the burning hot sun. And that must mean if you're not out there, then somebody is out there on your behalf. And you must be able to hire a lot of servants, or in the case of the slave masters, own a lot of slaves. It was a way of separating the classes, and people took great precautions to let them know that they did have servants. The problem here is the cruel reality of owning slaves. The Southern gentility um, liked to pride itself on the elegance of its manners. Um, this elegance was generally a facade. The cruel reality was it was a corruption of the character of these rich, white, slave-owning people. Um, a person that makes a very compelling case for this is a former slave himself, a guy by the name of Frederick Douglass, who says, I've seen it time and time again, what slavery will do is it'll make good people into bad people. And the reason is pretty simple. Um, what slavery requires is obedience to orders. You can't question, you can't feel sympathy or empathy or anything like that. If you do, the system of slavery is just simply not going to work. And so I want to ask you, who is it that you think is ordering the whippings, the beatings, uh, these sorts of things that ultimately come across as cruelty? And of course, the answer, it would be the slave owners. Another good example that you could point to would be the life and times of Harriet Jacobs, who, much like Frederick Douglass, would write an autobiography in terms of what it meant to be a slave in the antebellum South. And what she describes in that book is basically what you and I would call sexual assault. And all these um, slave owners, many of whom were, were prominent people in their churches and in their communities, were, were at the end of the day essentially guilty of sexual assault. More of that a little bit later in the semester. What I want to talk about now is the way that slave owners uh, implemented their will. Um, there was once upon a time that nobody really discussed or even wrote about the ways in which slave people resisted. But of course, as, as we certainly know, they resisted and they resisted in many forms and fashions. Uh, we don't really have time to get into them right now, but probably the most direct way that one could resist would be by running away, fleeing to the countryside and maybe hopefully making it into safe territory. I'll give you a good example of that safe territory here in a minute. To dissuade people from running away or rebelling, generally speaking, the English brought over many medieval punishments that were really exaggerated once they got to the New World. Um, one thing that would happen if you ran away, if you're following along with me, this will make a lot of sense on that PowerPoint there, is they would put you in a contraption which would slow you down. If you're looking at that uh, slide entitled Resistance and Accommodation, um, that's a good representation of what I'm talking about. Um, if you've got one of those little masks over your mouth, it's going to be next to impossible to eat or maybe even drink. If you've got one of those collars that he's wearing there, it's going to make it really, really difficult for you to maneuver and get through the brush in places like uh, Georgia, South Carolina. And um, if, if you ran away again, they, they might have to take even more serious precautions. Uh, one of Thomas Jefferson's earliest memories was watching uh, a slave that had run away numerous times have his two big toes amputated. Now, aside from the gore and just the cruelty of all of this, you have to understand that there's a context as well. Jefferson was a Virginian, which meant that the cash crop of choice was tobacco. And as we discovered, tobacco was profitable, but it wasn't nearly as profitable as sugar. So you couldn't just blow somebody away and make an example of them that way. Um, you wanted an example, and certainly amputation would would set would, would qualify as such. But you needed that slave. Um, that was a huge, huge investment. It would be like throwing away a, an entire Mercedes Benz simply because its brakes needed a little bit of a touch up. So hopefully you can see why that might resonate with Virginia planters. Now, if you ran away you know, more than three times, at that point, they needed to take really serious measures when it comes to making an example out of you. And so if you ran away more than three times, and there really wasn't any you know, magic number, so to speak, um, it was all one by one personal basis. But if you were a man, uh, many times this might mean that you uh, were executed via castration. Um, in addition to running away, we, we now know that there were other sorts of 
resistance, um, more passive, less violent, uh, silent protests, not working as hard as one might, um, negotiations. Uh, we now have records of slave uh, men that would negotiate with their masters to not allow them to sell their women and uh, children into different parts of the country. Um, some people went as far as proclaiming that they would chop off their hand or their foot and not be nearly as productive if they did break apart their families. Um, but we also see violence, and I'll give you a very good example of that violence a little bit later. For right now, I want to talk a little bit about the Northern Maritime Economy and its connections to slavery. We have a tendency to think of slavery as only existing in the South. Um, I told you the last time we met that it existed in places like New York, even existed in places like Massachusetts, even though Massachusetts would be the first state to make it illegal. But even those people that aren't directly implicated, they're, they're profiting from a slave economy. A couple examples here. In places like Austin, um, shipbuilding was a really important industry. Um, where do you think those ships are going? Uh, they're going down to the Caribbean to move product, whether that be sugar, whether that be textile to supply the slaves with, you know, things like clothing. Um, codfish that was caught up in New England and shipped down as a food source for the slave population. Iron working in, 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 in colonies like Pennsylvania. Um, we, we've got things like chains. We've, we've got things like uh, those collars that I showed you a second ago. Um, finance. People, I mean, slavery is a huge, huge investment, and a lot of times these banks in places like New York and Boston, um, they're getting into that business, and, and they're financing the buying and selling of slaves. Insurance industry, like any other commodity, you would want to make sure that uh, your, your cargo was insured uh, if in case it did not make its, 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 its final destination. In short, there's some pretty household names that we would probably recognize today that really get their start. Um, indirectly associated with the slavery economy. But the big one, guys, the big one would be textile. Um, there's a huge textile industry in England, and there's a growing textile industry. We'll talk about this a little bit later in the semester. There's a growing textile industry in New England, Massachusetts in particular. And um, toward the, um, the, the end of the antebellum period, as we approach the Civil War, there's going to be an anti-slavery uh, abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, a guy named Charles Sumner, who's going to come up with this idea, a saying, if you will, this unholy alliance between the lords of the lash, slave owners, and the lords of the loom, um, factory owners that are producing textile. I mean, you can't produce textile without cotton, and cotton is generally the cash crop uh, in the North American economy, certainly after the year 1800. So my point is, this is a very in, in interconnected economy, and it's got a lot of moving parts. And while some of the parts of the country might, might not be directly associated with slavery and the slave economy, indirectly they very much are. There's also a very clear negative effect on the white working class. Again, Frederick Douglass makes this case very, very clearly in his autobiography. Um, he proclaims that, um, that, that, that basically what, what, what slavery does for working class whites would be to completely eliminate job categories in some cases and degrade white labor in others. Uh, they're eliminating job opportunities. I mean, why would you pay somebody to do something when you can go have your slave do it for free? So there are fewer economic opportunities. But one thing that maybe a little bit overlooked when it comes to the impact on, on, on the white working class is the fact that they themselves were forced to police the system, to enforce it, generally speaking. Let me give you a couple examples. It was different depending on exactly which colony and later on state you're talking about, but generally every, every slave state had a law that required mandatory service in the slave patrol. Um, what these patrols were, were, were generally uh, working class white men that would uh, police the countryside looking for people that had run away, or maybe some just more generally looking for people of African ancestry in places that they were just not supposed to be. This was not voluntary. This was, this was compulsory. 
I've seen statistics that said every man from 16 years of age right up to 70 years of age was required to volunteer his time and services um, at many points throughout the throughout the year. So even at the same time that you see economic opportunity shrinking for working class whites, they're being forced by the powers that be to, to, to police the system, generally speaking. Another quick example would be what I call, this is certainly not a clinical term, but it's what I call Sunday gun day. Slaves were forced to work six days out of the week. Um, they would have an opportunity to have a day off, some were anyway, on Sunday, that being a religious day. Um, so if there's one day out of the week that a slave revolt is going to come, it's going to be on Sunday because they're all off that day. And that meant that the people that were going to church of the of the white variety had to be ready. And this was not universal either, but on certain instances, it was required, again, not voluntary, but it was required that you bring at least one gun to church with you. You, you could bring more, you could bring other weapons like knives, if, if that suited you, but you had to bring at least one, one, one weapon, one gun. And so as you can see, this has a very negative impact on the working class white population um, in a multitude of different ways. Speaking of rebellions, probably the best example that I can give you when it comes to a slave rebellion with considerable consequences for the immediate future is going to come in the year 1739. It's going to come to be known as the Stono Rebellion. You'll see why here in a second. As I said before, most slave owners preferred to get a variety of slaves from all around the continent, not just specifically one region, one group. The Congo, or what would become known as the Congo, had, had sent thousands, tens of thousands of people to the Americas at the behest of these slave traders. One of them, we think, was a man by the name of Jemmy. And we believe that Jemmy was responsible for what will become known as the Stono Rebellion of 1739. What Jemmy's going to do is he is going to team up with many like-minded people. And they're going to conduct a raid on Hutchinson's store. What Hutchinson dealt was firearms and ammunition. And so what they begin doing is raiding the store and then they dole out all the weaponry. And, and, their, and their purpose is not to completely conquer South Carolina. The, the, the Stono Rebellion is called the Stono Rebellion because it, it is taking place, it's formating, formulating rather, along the banks of the Stono River in South Carolina. But back to my point, it's not to overthrow the ruling structure of South Carolina, certainly not to conquer it. What they're trying to do is to get to Florida. And the reason why Florida is really simple, that's Spanish territory. And not so long before this rebellion emerged, the Spanish government had made slavery illegal in, in Florida. So if you can make it to Florida, you're home free. It's a lot like the Underground Railroad several years later. And if you can make it to Canada, British territory, where slavery is no longer legal, you're off the hook, right? You're in a completely separate country that slavery is no longer legal. So they're headed to Florida so that they can escape. They're intercepted on the banks of the Stono River. What they're really trying to do is they're trying to pick up more support, and long story short, they, they, they ended up failing to that end. It does result in violence. Um, the rebellion managed to claim the lives of 20 whites who were there trying to put an end to the rebellion. 44 slaves were killed. Many of them captured, and um, of the capture, they were all executed. I think that that went without saying that they would be executed, but they were done so in a very public, um, easy to access sort of fashion, because again, you're trying to send the message that this will not stand and this will be dealt with very harshly. But the significance and the um, and the impact of the Stono Rebellion is, is really what's important. The legacy, if you will. Probably about the best legacy that we can point to comes a year later in what will come to be known in South Carolina as the Negro Act of 1740. What the Negro Act says is that there will, there will be certain rules, um, codes, and regulations for the conduct of people of Af African ancestry. What this does is, is lays in place um, a series of rules. For example, you can't be out after dark. 
you are out after dark, you've got to be accompanied by a white person. You've got to have some sort of supervision or chaperone. Um, and, and, and probably most importantly, you cannot own a weapon. You do not have access to weapons. Um, keep in mind, um, that was the legacy of the raiding of the store there. So the Negro Act, in a lot of ways, is a response to the Stono Rebellion. That's important. But what might even be more important is, is it's almost like a prelude to what would come later in the 19th century with the Black Codes. Um, these Black Codes in places like Georgia would, would govern, similar to the Negro Act, would govern with respect to exactly what you could and could not do. And this is not going to end even in the Civil War era. You're going to see these black codes reemerge in the aftermath of the Civil War as well. A little bit differently, but I think that you get the idea. So what I want to do with the time that we have remaining is, is get you to understand the interconnectedness of the system of slavery um, and get you to understand that it was experienced differently depending on where you're talking about. And um, it had negative consequences, uh, whether we're talking about um, working class whites, uh, people of the Southern gentility variety, it did not really matter who we were talking about. It was generally destructive. Certainly that's the case that Frederick Douglass is gonna make. And I'm hopeful that that sheds light on certain other elements of the class. For right now, that's all we've got.